Okay. Well, tonight we're recycling a two-year-old program. And I just wanted to put up this picture of our two colleagues whom we <laughs> miss very much, Sam and Jack. They're both too busy to participate with us anymore, but um, their slides, uh, they still allow us to use their slides and, uh, and we still see them around there, but miss them. All right. So uh, as you, we go along, uh, feel free to write questions in the chat. And, and Susan and, and Kathy, would you please follow the chat? Because I can't see it while I'm doing this. All right. Um, these are sometimes called waterfowl, but they're not. This is the double-crested cormorant, entirely different group, the loon, and the greaves, like the horn greave. Um, and even coots are not technically waterfowl. Ducks, geese, and swans are the ones that we are technically waterfowl. They all have webbed feet and coots do not. So the family of, of birds is the family Anatidae, which is the major part of the order Anseriformes. And that family includes swans, geese, and ducks. And they all have webbed feet, this wood duck. They all also have the uropygial gland the oil-filled preening gland by a bird's tail. And they use their beaks to spread the oil across their feathers to make them waterproof. And that is very important because they, um, they have to be able to regulate their body temperature and stay dry. And for waterproofing, the feather structure is very important. So a yearly molt occurs to grow in new feathers. So now I'm going to list four species of ducks that breed in our area. First, the wood duck in forested wetlands. Second, the model duck, which is also called the Florida duck, a relative of the mallard that is more widespread across North America, and the black duck, which is in certain places up north. So there's our model duck. And then we have the two whistling ducks, which didn't used to breed in Florida, but they've moved up from the Southwest or possibly in the case of the black-billed whistling duck, they think maybe escape from aviculture. And um, Susan or Kathy are gonna talk more about them coming up. But although those breed here, many species winter here. And here they are with American coots and on the wildlife drive, coots and black neck stilts. All right, well, here's some basic duck biology. Only females care for the young. And the female, that's why they have to wear the cryptic camouflage plumage. Whereas the male ducks adorned with colorful plumage put on elaborate courtship displays to attract females' attention. And migratory ducks pair up on the wintering grounds or in migration. And I'll talk more about that. Males follow the females to the breeding ground and stay until about the time the eggs are laid. I'm not sure whether this is from Orlando Wetlands Park but it, or the Wildlife Drive, but it's a moving teal pair, paired up. And the males may breed in different locations and this contributes to mixing of the populations. So again, the females migrate to their same breeding grounds and the males, since they've paired up with a completely different male down here in the winter, it's making different males go to the area, which is a mixing of the genes. It happens that there are more ma males and females and the males are promiscuous. So ducks produce hybrids more often than other birds. And cinnamon teal is the congener the same species in another part of the country. It's the one that's common in the West. And so it, it is able to hybridize with the blue wing teal. And uh, this is one that was at Orlando's Wetlands Park in 2017. And many of you have seen the, the hybrid on the wildlife drive. It was there, was it last year or the two years ago? And then again this year. So why do ducks migrate? for food, because up north, the summer days are longer, which gives ducks more time to feed their young on the tons and tons of insects and other invertebrates that hatch up there. 
And where do they breed mostly? In the prairie pothole region, which is this whole part of Canada, North Dakota, South Dakota, a little bit of Montana, even into Iowa. And what that region is, is where glaciers have scoured out these shallow pools and wetlands. And these are perfect breeding places for the ducks. Now ducks are strong flyers. A migrating flock of mallard travels an estimated 55 miles per hour. And they migrate at altitudes of 200 to 4,000 feet, but are capable of reaching much greater heights. These are pintails migrating. And most will migrate just behind a cold front when the sky is crystal clear and the temperature is plummeting and the winds are blowing southward. They also tend to migrate around the clock with more birds moving at night than during the day. And ducks as, and geese in North America migrate along four flyways, the Pacific, the Central, the Mississippi and the Atlantic. And it was banding research that allowed this mapping of flyways. And it, working with flyways has been useful for management purposes. Now, hunting is a big industry. What keeps hunters from wiping out duck populations? Regulations and conservation programs that started in the 1930s when drought dried up the wetlands. That was the Dust Bowl era. That was a significant multi-year drought. So the duck stamps was something that was um, perfected, if not invented, by Ding Darling, a Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist for the Des Moines Register, who was famous for lampooning politicians, including Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who then later hired him and for his passion for conservation. So the US Fish and Wildlife Service produces the federal duck stamp and duck hunters are required to purchase one each year in order to hunt. And Ding Darling resurrected the idea of raising funds through a hunting tax and FDR, who was a lifelong stamp collector, hatched the idea of a stamp that would invoke the beauty of the wildlife the tax would be used to protect. And with the funding source assured, Congress passed the Migratory Bird Hunting and Conservation Stamp Act in 1934. Sales of duck stamps are approximately 40 million each year. 98% of the purchase price goes directly to buy and lease wetland habitat on national wildlife refuges. And over 6 million acres of strategic wetland and grassland habitat have been conserved through duck stamps. And we encourage birders to buy them as well as hunters. Birders, if you buy them through the American Birding Association, then they can track and say how many people have bought them. Um, $25 and it's a beautiful stamp you could collect. So question, guess what state has the most national wildlife refuges? You put it in the chat. North Dakota. Okay. <laughs> it is North Dakota. Uh, and it sits right in the country's prairie pothole region, a glaciated landscape of shallow basins covering 5.3 million acres in parts of Montana, the Dakotas, Minnesota, and Iowa. Millions of migrating canvasbacks, mallards, pintails, gadwall, teal, and other waterfowl flock to seasonal wetland ponds to breed, earning the, the area the nickname America's Duck Factory. And how did these wildlife refuges get started? Um, FDR, Actually, uh, he, he hired Ding Darling and Ding Darling hired biologist J. Clark Saylor um, in 1934 to manage the National Wildlife Refuge System. And he handpicked many of North Dakota's Dust Bowl era refugees. refuges. <laughs> Saylor crisscrossed the drought parched state in his station wagon, sometimes driving 600 miles a day to find distressed farmlands and buy those he could. In spring 1939, Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed executive orders establishing 29 new purchases as wildlife refuges. And one of the best is named after Siler, Sailor. So any questions so far? Got a lot of information here. Um, I'd like to break it up. 
So the National Wildlife Refuge System, well, you know that it was started in 1903 with Pelican Island by Teddy Roosevelt. But in the 30s, it got a big boost by the duck stamp program. All right, then. So the most common duck and the most popular for hunting, the mallard. Look at all these beautiful green heads up north where they breed. And the second most common duck in the US is the blue winged teal. So where specifically do ducks nest? In grasslands next to wetlands, many species do. To recover from migration and get ready to nest, mallard and pintail hens, and this is a pintail hen, feed in wetlands on protein rich invertebrates like insects and snails. And once they've eaten enough, they explore the surrounding grassland to find the best place to nest. Dense, heavy vegetation is best for survival of mallard or pintail ducklings. And then a few species nest over water, like redheads and canvasbacks make their nest right in wetlands on floating mats of vegetation like cattails and bulrushes. And a few nest in holes in trees, or in this case, an artificial cavity. And those are the wood ducks and the hooded mergansers. And I think Kathy and Susan will be profiling these ducks, so I won't say too much. But um, anyway, those are the three varieties of where they nest. And the ducklings, all the ducklings, when they're hatched, they're precocial, which means ready to go, able to walk, swim, eat, and follow their parents. And quite cute. So question so far. All right, then let me keep quiz you. What four duck species breed? Well, you know wood ducks, and then the yeah. other one up that's yeah. up north is the hooded mergansers, actually. Yeah. All right. Well, good job. Um, okay, so I just want to distinguish dabbling and diving ducks. Dabbling ducks eat more vegetation, some invertebrates, feed in shallower water, and the diving ducks eat invertebrates and fish and feed in deeper water. Um, so like the American widgeon, it's a dabbler and they tip up like that. The model ducks are, um, and you've all seen, if you go to the wildlife driver or wetlands park, you've seen the blue winged teal and the way they kind of go sideways, um, just dabbling. And then the diving ducks actually dive, can dive pretty deep. Um, now, incidentally, I'm getting these pictures from various sources and I could not find a picture of diving ducks feeding, excuse me, diving ducks diving. So if you have the ability to take a picture like that, we could, that, you know, that one would be prized. <laughs> All right, here's another picture of the way they can take off. Um, the uh, dabbling ducks can take off almost vertically. Whereas the heavier diving ducks kind of have to go forward quite a bit before they get really aloft. Not as bad as coots that have to paddle along the water, but uh, they're, since they're so heavy, it's harder to take off. All right, dabblers also have more colorful wings. And uh, these are the parts of the wings, uh, secondaries. And here is a picture of blue winged teal and so they've got this blue patch and then they've got green here. But wings hidden are hidden at rest. So although you can learn the parts and all, you're not gonna see them until they fly. Now on molting, the flight feathers need to be replaced once a year. And whereas other birds have a sequential molt where different feathers are replaced, but the bird can still fly. Ducks have a synchronous molt of all the flight feathers, dropping all the primaries and secondaries at once. They become flightless for a few weeks while new flight feathers grow in. So I was reading more and more about this and I was learning that ducks from the prairie pothole region actually go north during molting to an area where the, in, like in the, almost in the tundra or the boreal marshes where there's lots of insect hatch so that they can get enough food and energy to 
um, put in the new feathers. They apparently are very high in protein, you know, carrot and all that. Um, so that, it's all pretty interesting. And the blue winged teal, and to a lesser extent, the cinnamon teal and the northern shoveler arrive here in eclipse plumage, which is the female plumage. And so you'll notice it if you haven't already in a previous year. In the fall, when they first get here, the blue winged teal all look like males. But some are, some are, are excuse me, they all look like females, but some are males and they are just in eclipse plumage because of their, the way they, their cycle of molting. And the mating occurs on the wintering grounds or in migration in most of these ducks. And in our case with the blue winged teal, they mate and pair up here. You'll see them all nicely in pairs now, whereas earlier in the season, they were in groups that looked like groups of, of uh, females, but they were actually some males. So any questions so far? Uh, dabbling and diving ducks, you know the differences and you know that molting ducks have to molt all their feathers at once, which is unusual in the bird world. And so they have to be inactive for a few weeks while they feed up and molt in those flight feathers. Okay, I've just got a few more slides and I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy and Susan. I wanna tell that um, again, that waterfowl are in the family Anatidae, and if you know anything about the naming and biology, the family will be named for the biggest genus, and so the gen type genus is Anas. Okay, so most of the ducks were named Anas, actually the dabbling ducks. The um, diving ducks are the genus Ethia. But anyway, now they pulled out several species in the genus, put them in the genus Spatula. So I'm gonna just profile the spatula diving ducks and then I'm gonna turn it on over. Before we go there, Laura had a question. Uh -huh. do, do ducks, I, I, I think she says, do lats get killed during the molting period? So is there a greater risk during the molting period? I would, of natural predation, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Natural animals could get them because they're kind of, they can't really fly. Good question. Okay, so the blue winged teal is named Spatula Discourse now, and um, it has a chalky blue patch on the wings that you could see when it flies, and a green speculum. This part is called the speculum. And the male has a dark belly, and the female has a light belly. And the range, see so here, here's the prairie pothole region and, and, and other areas and then they're migrating, and then they're wintering down here. And here's a, a spectrogram, not a spectrogram, whatever you call it. A, what do we call this, Susan and Kathy? Bar um, chart. Bar, bar graph. Bar, 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 bar chart of, their, of when they're here. The distribution. OK, so you can see that some do stay over, uh, even in the summer, a very, very few. But basically, they're here in the winter. Okay, so, and they are, again, they arrive in eclipse plumage. So you'll notice it next season, if you haven't ever noticed that, that it looks like a bunch of females, but they're, those are actually will molt in that nice white crescent. So Paula oh. has a question. When is a good time to see ducks in the North Dakota pothole? The summer, which would not be too early. Uh, so May, June, July the summer. And, and uh, um, I would love to tell you more about it because I did make that trip and it's really cool. Okay, so the cinnamon teal I just said is the congener. It, it's the one that's dominant in the West. I mean, lucky them, it's so pretty. Um, but when it accidentally comes here, it can interbreed with the blue winged teal because they're so closely related. They see that's its range. And that's why we get so excited when we see them because it doesn't come normally to us. And so we've had various crosses um, over the years. And now I'll go to the Northern Shoveler, which is a, a fairly close relative, although it's bigger. Um, and the, the same thing, when they first come, you'll notice 
that they look like mostly females, but the, gradually they start molting in the male coloration. Pretty cool. Um, they have conspicuous bristle-like lamellae to funnel in um, the, the food. And the, as I said, they arrive in eclipsed plumage. And this is where they breed again, the prairie of prothal region. Now the green wing teal though is not in that close group. Um, and consequently you would not see a hybrid of a green wing and a blue wing teal. But here they are together and you can see the differences. Green wing is smaller. The male has a brown head with a green patch and a white mark here. Um, the green wing teal, again, prairie pothole. Um, they look very cool when they fly. Uh, you can see the males and uh, it's a black mark on the wing. Uh, it's a green speculum, but it ends up looking black in flight. And here's another picture of them together. Oh, here, yes, it's green here and then black here. Uh, and then here's the blue, here's the green wing teal and the blue wing teal. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over. All right, so I'm gonna talk about the black belly and oh, just comment from Paula. Yeah, green wing teals are at Orlando Wetlands Park. It's a pretty good place to see them. Lake Apopka sometimes, but you really have to search. So the black belly whistling ducks do breed here in Florida. They did um, come over from out West. Um, their population is doing rather well and they are really, really noisy. You will hear them from far away. They have a long legged silhouette, so you can see them from a distance really well. They used to be called tree ducks. A couple of duck ducks have been called tree ducks. And you can go to the next slide. So um, they, they are seen often walking on land and perching in trees, which the first time you see it, you'll just be flabbergasted because, you know, ducks and trees, especially at the wetlands. You don't, you know, Lake Popka, there's not that many trees for them to perch on. I've even seen them perch on uh, telephone wires, which is really strange. <laughs> so you can see their distribution there. Let me go to the next slide. And when they fly, they have that white patch on their wings and followed by the black. And they're usually doing the da 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 da, -da noise. So they're pretty easy to pick out when they're flying around. Now the fulvous whistling duck. Now the fulvous whistling duck is not as widespread in Florida. There's only a few places to see them and Lake Apopka is one of them. And um, they're related to the black belly, but they're of this beautiful caramel color. And we go look at the next one. And this duck is not only found in, in um, the Americas, but it's also found in Africa and Asia as well, which I found really interesting. They're also called tree ducks. Um, if there's rice fields, they really like hanging out in the rice fields, feeding there. Um, we obviously don't have them in Florida, so we'll find them in the marshes. Um, they started breeding in, in North America in the late 19th and 20th century. And, um, I believe they're doing pretty well. Um, like I said, they do breed here. So both the black bellied and the fulvous look for the young ducklings in the summer. They're really cute. Kathy, we did have a question about the black belly whistling ducks uh -huh. from Laura. She wanted to know, do we know why they travel east more than? I, I, I couldn't answer that for you. We'd have to, to research it more. They're, maybe they're just better generalists and what they eat and where they like to live. Um, and they're another duck that, that will nest in trees. Um, Cause I, we had, I live near a lake and we had, um, black belly whistling ducks nesting in a cavity across the street, which is really interesting. Okay, so let's see what we have next. And there's a beautiful look. Um, so go to Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive and you will see these ducks. They're very, very handsome ducks. And they're, they're, they whistle too, but it's like, da da. it's a very short call. So let's talk about wood ducks. And wood ducks live in wooded swamps. And um, they will also come into like city parks, <coughs> like Mead Gardens, 
um, some of the like Lake Davis, you won't find like a fulvous duck there, but you'll find like wood ducks. I guess they're more, you know, uh, used to being around people, though they are skittish. They're one of the few ducks that have strong claws that can grip bark and perch on branches. So they will also perch up on trees. You can see their distribution. They do breed here. They breed all the way in the east and some central parts. Um, they pair up in January, so they're pairing up now. And they regularly produce two broods. Most ducks don't. Um, they do nest in trees. And here's usually over water, but not always. They can nest up to a mile from, from the water. And the ducklings, when they're ready, uh, when they hatch and they're ready to come out, which is not maybe a day after they hatch, they'll jump out. They can jump out over 50 feet. They don't get harmed. And then their mother duck will lead them to water, even if it's a mile away. So it's pretty amazing. We go to the next slide. And this is what they look like in flight. So if you're trying to figure out if something's a wood duck, if it's a male, it's a little bit easier because you're going to see these rings on their neck. And that's what you want to look for. Um, they do eat plants. Um, they nest in cavities and they are dabblers. And they're doing pretty, pretty good. So look at the next duck. And oh, here's a uh, female. See how the female is much more subdued coloration and there's some ducklings. And there's a, a wood duck perched on a tree. And that's what a natural cavity looks like. But they will go to nest boxes too. So if you live near a lake, you can put up a nest box. And there's a pair. And actually the other day I was at Mead and saw the male and female on top of one of the nest boxes right there, Alice's Pond. So be duckling soon. So here's our hooded merganser. Now this is one of our winter visitors. And um, they also nest in tree cavities, but they obviously don't nest in Florida. But you have a good chance of seeing one in the winter time, but you want to look at a place with a little bit deeper water because they are diving ducks and you're not gonna follow, find them in a shallow pond. Sometimes it doesn't need to be a very big body of water. It could be a retention pond. Often I see these at retention ponds. So that was the male. This is the female. It's more subdued coloration, but they both have that really nice hood on their head that they will raise up different times. Oftentimes they'll be flat. So they'll look different. So this duck is really interesting. You'll see one. If you see it from the back, it looks just totally different. So you have to kind of look at it, think about it. Um, you can see, you know, they, they breed up here and then they winter Actually, they breed in purple places and they winter down here. And we'll go to the next slide. And um, their legs are far back on their body. So they're very awkward on land. I've only seen them on land a few times, um, but they're really good swimmers. Um, you can see all the white on them when they're flying and they do eat fish. And let's see, I think. Oh, they find their prey underwater by sight. They're able to compensate for refraction in the water, which is really interesting. And we go to the next slide. There's one eating a nice fish. So they're fun to watch. If you see one at a local pond, just watch, watch them feeding. And then the red-breasted merganser is not very frequently in our part of the state. Occasionally we'll get one. They're more coastal. They are known as a sawbill because they have serrated bill for grasping uh, slippery fish. And they need to eat a lot. They eat 15 to 20 fish per day. So they're doing a lot of diving. So when you see these, you're, they're not gonna, you're gonna see it and then you're not gonna see it for a while because it's diving and getting some food. We go to the next one. And <clears throat> there's another nice picture. Another good place to see them. Uh, I see them at Fort DeSoto a good place to look for those so they're more coastal than they are inland but once a year or so we get them at Lake Apopka sometimes in the lake sometimes in the deeper ponds on the property and you can see they breed way up north and so they winter more coastal as you can see here and that's what they look like when they're flying really distinct And there is a little bit more about them. They do eat fish and they surface dive and they're doing okay right now. 
So we go on to our next duck, the buffalo head. It is another hooded duck, but you notice the male, the white is much larger area and it actually has purplish down here and greenish up front. If you get them in the right light, they're amazing. And sometimes we get the males in the breeding plumage down here. So this is another diving duck. And um, interesting, there's some males. Interesting about them is they are cavity nesters, but they favor woodpecker holes and they um, favor northern flicker holes more than any other duck. They are monogamous. Um, they have shown up in other countries like Japan and Greenland, which is interesting. This is a female or a young male. They have that white patch here. They're a small duck. So you're gonna see in one of the slides how compared to a goose, how small they are. There's a few in our area right now. So here, doesn't even show them being in Florida, but we do get some in central Florida. And especially if you go to North Florida, you'll see more. And they do breed up here. In Canada and really interesting uh, patterns on their wings when they fly. Yeah, they do play hide and seek. They're hard to photograph. So look, check this out. I took this in North Florida. Here's a, a Canada goose and here's a buffalo head and that's that's its full size. So they, they are small, tiny and they do and they and they're like real buoyant. So they'll dive and then they'll pop up. So they're a lot of fun to watch. And um, you see they nest in cavities and they do eat aquatic invertebrates and they're doing okay too. Like I said, there's a few around. So here's our mallards. Now mallards are really interesting duck. The mallard is the originator of most domestic ducks. They, they came from the mallards. So you'll see the white ones, you'll see ones that are white and black. There's all different variations. So something to differentiate a, a mallard which we technically don't have true full-on mallards in Central Florida. If you go to North Florida, you'll see them. <clears throat> the male has this green head. Um, their speculum is blue bordered in white. They have a curly tail. That's some of the distinguish. It, it gets kind of tricky because there's a lot of hybrids. And we spend a lot of time looking at ducks saying, mm, is this a mallard model? It, you know, I'm not, I'm not there in my expertise on ducks, but down here, basically, we, we have more of the domestic type. <laughs> we can go to the next slide. And it is the most common species of duck in North America. They're doing quite well. Um, they are omnivores and they nest on the ground and they are a dabbler. All right, they hybridize with all these types of ducks, model, gadwalls, pintails, cinnamon teal, green wing tails, canvas backs, American black ducks, Muscovy ducks, Hawaiian ducks, gray ducks of New Zealand. And woo, just a lot. So there's very few pure mallards in Florida. And there's a little quiz. Whoops, sorry. That picture was a little quiz. If you can guess yeah. what it, what it. Um... Uh, well, we'll go back. That's okay. That, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's okay. What do you think it hybridized with? Oh, that one right there. Yeah, that's a little so, cool. Anyone want to guess that that's a mallard <laughs> hybridized with what? With what? Pintail. Pintail. Yeah, that's an easy one. Very cool. All right, so we have one more duck. I'm going to talk about the model duck, which was also called the Florida duck. And this is a tricky one because they do hybridize with the mallards. So we call the hybrids muddle ducks. You might hear people saying that. It, they are found in Florida and also along the, the Gulf Coast into Mexico and a little bit on the coast in Georgia and South Carolina. Um, they, they pair bond early, like in November. They are closely related to Mexican and American black ducks. And we go to the next slide. Here's some nice pictures. Um, you can notice here, they don't have that white border in their speculum. They don't have a curly tail. So there's a, two things to look at, but you gotta look at more than that. Um, and when they fly, you're gonna notice the white underwings. And if you see they're secondary, there's 
little or no white border. So these are model ducks right there. And we do have some at Orlando Wetlands and we do have some at Lake Apopka. And Paula asks, is there a native aspect to those that breed with other species? Well, it just, it, then that species might lose its unique identity. That's the problem because then there might not be any more uh, model ducks because they've been interbred. So that's the negative part, just losing the diversity. And I think that's the last picture I have and it's on to Susan. All right. So now we're going to talk about the American widgeon, AKA bald pate. And that's because if you look at the male, they have that white across the front that kind of makes them look bald. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So here's kind of where they, um, okay, widgeon, you know, when I first, I wasn't sure, is it with a G, with a DG, both spellings are acceptable. Um, they are a dabbling duck, and from what I've read, they like to actually, they spend more time swimming than a lot of the other dabbling ducks. They are, again, you can see they're one of those prairie pothole breeding ducks. And although they are a low conservation concern. And here's kind of an idea. You can take a look at them. They have a cream forehead, a green head. They're very actually pretty ducks. Pale pink, red flanks, uh, that little white wing patch you can kind of see. The females are a little bit darker with chest, kind of a rusty brown flanks, um, a dark mottled head with kind of that darker around the eye. They both have the both sexes have that short blue bills with the little black tip. And we can go to the next one. So they are vegetation eaters, including duckweed, pondwing, water milfoil, and widgeon grass. And I put in a little picture of widgeon grass. And I don't know if they're named for widgeon grass, but I'm going to think it's a pretty good assumption. I did not see whether it was positive or not on that. But you can see when they're flying the white wing patch and uh, again, up on the top, the green secondaries. So there are some males that will have a white throat, cheek and throat, and hunters will call them a storm widgeon. So most widgeons will have kind of the darker throat. So if you see one with the white throat, you've got a storm widgeon. And then the females and um, immature males will look like the one on the right, kind of a plain head. So gadwalls, these are really pretty intricately patterned duck, almost like the tuxedo ducks. The female does resemble a mallard, mallard but with a thinner, darker bill than the mallard. Um, some people call them pirates because they actually um, will take food from diving ducks and coots as they surface. So, and these ducks are actually have done well and have actually increased in their numbers since the 80s. So here's a little map of where they breed, kind of in a more limited area than a lot of the other ducks and migrate again. Um, you know how Deborah was saying they kind of go north a little bit. And then they're kind of down here wintering with us and we can see them. We don't see them as frequently, but they are, if you look, you can find them very pretty with that distinct dark um, rear patch rump. So that, again, when they're flying, you can look, for, or even out, you can look for the black rumps and a white wing patch to pick them out from the other ducks. Okay, northern pintail. This is a um, beautiful male. These are really elegant ducks. Um, they have that signature white stripe on the chocolate color head in their breeding colors. Um, a really beautiful, long, upright tail. They also, they are like one of the first ducks to go up to the prairie potholes in northern Canada. They get there right when the ice breaks to start breeding. They're kind of the first to go back. So here's a male on top. You can see he's got a green speculum and that you can see that real distinctive white line that kind of makes the head look very elegant, very long neck, very long tail. And then the female is a little bit plainer, a little darker head. Um, 
But again, an immature may also look like that. And here's their breeding up high in the prairie potholes in northern Canada, Canada. <clears throat> and then they are spending the winters here. So we will see them down in here. And here's a beautiful picture, possibly from the wetlands and for where a group are kind of getting feeding and wintering and spending time in Florida, little snowbirds. So the next duck is a canvas back. These are those nice ducks that have the kind of the wedge shape, very long sloping foreheads, um, the rusty heads. They have a white body with dark, I guess you could say dark on both ends. That's a good way to recognize them. They're found only in North America. Uh, the male also has a dark belly. A uh, scapular and mantles are white and pale gray. The female is a lighter rufous overall. You can say they do breed in, up in Canada and some in that prairie pothole. And they do come down. We do see them on occasion. They're not as common, but we do see them down here in um, during the winter time. And you can see the distribution is really start coming in more in November. And they're they're leaving pretty early. So hmm. okay, the redhead. These are beautiful ducks as far as the red head and the grayish body again darker on either side and you can see here's one compared to a like some fulvous whistling ducks they do have the black at the end of the beak tip on a kind of a bluish beak so deep red head puffy and round looking black breast gray body blue gray bill black tip um Again, breeding up in that prairie pothole, we can't say enough about the fact that we're very happy they conserved a lot of the lands up there. And they will, we can see them here. We've seen them mostly coastally. Um, I think if you go over, uh, you know, to the coast, you often see them a little bit more than you do here, but we do get some in mixed in with our duck flocks that we see like at the Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive, we'll see a redhead several redheads in there. And here's a picture at St. Mark's. They have a great numbers of them. I think when we went to Fort DeSoto, we saw a whole pond filled with redheads. So it was very pretty, very nice. And these on Lake Huron, December 28th. So here's where they are up north and lots of redheads feeding, getting ready to uh, move out. And these are a few that are going down to the Texas area. And this is when they fly. You can see they're kind of a brownish duck, white belly, uh, light under wings with a little dark edge. Um, Susan, the Laguna Atacosa Wildlife Refuge was set up specifically for the redhead. Ah, uh -huh. very good. So greater and lesser scaps, we kind of put them together because people are always kind of confused and they're still tough. Um, lesser scaps are a little bit smaller than a greater scalp. Um, they, but they both are kind of a grayish, you know, with black, well, dark, I shouldn't say black, but dark head and front and dark tail portion. Females are brownish. We'll go. This is the basic plumage, male and female. So in a lesser scalp, they do have, um, one of the best ways to tell is, does it have that like um, peak at the back of the head? The greater is the peak is closer or it's puffy rounder in the front. When you're taking a peak, they're also a little bit bigger, but that can be hard to tell if they're not next to each other. So lesser scalp, you can see they're pretty widely distributed, these ducks, and greater scalps are actually even more, just like have a, even a greater area 
These are, I think they call them the only circumpolar diving ducks. The greater scope is in steep decline population wise. Um, and the best place is to see them is along the coast, but we do get them coming on occasion. And we see them in the drive like a popka, usually out in the water um, because they are diving ducks or the deeper ponds. Um, lesser scap are doing really well. They kind of congregate in huge flocks. You might look out, if you have a scope, look out onto like a popka, you might see thousands of them out there. Um, the males are black and white. They're kind of chocolatey. The females are chocolatey brown. They do dive for plants and invertebrates. Ring neck ducks are last duck. Now these ducks, if you were to have one in your hand, you can see that they do have um, a little neck ring, but uh, most of us feel they should have been called ring bill ducks because that's the feature that you really see the most. We can go to the next slide. So ring necks ducks, the breeding male has that nice, um, beautiful kind of a, I, I almost think it's purpley looking with the yellow eye and the female is darker, but they both have share having that nice uh, ring around the bill, which makes them pretty easy to identify if you're just starting. They do breed in up the Canada, up in North, and they will come down and spend winters with us. And they are very, um, common duck, very large numbers. You'll see here in Lake Apocopa Wildlife Drive, and you'll see them on the lake. So we do get quite quite a bit of these ducks coming to stay with us during the winter. So in flight, here's a picture of them in flight, and you can see they uh, come down in <clears throat> November, and they'll leave around March. There are a few that can be found occasionally um, throughout, but not very high numbers. So they're kind of pretty hard to find in the summer, but they kind of have just a plain look to them. Um, any questions about any duck ducks that we discussed? We finished just at, at uh, eight o'clock and you can see we're very enthusiastic about waterfowl. There's a hand up from Alex. So a question, Laura has a question. Do you know if the same birds are usual around the Texas Gulf and the Florida Gulf? Do you know if anybody's doing banding research on that? Uh, I'm not certain about that. Yes, we're not certain, but yes, both are, are wintering grounds that are pretty good. Like I said, that Laguna Atacosa was set up for redheads. Since you're asking about the wintering, I want to say that canvasbacks are rare. If you see them on a lake, let's say you're boating and doing a CBC, um, it comes up rare because, um, well, they don't come down all the way here anymore. Uh, maybe global warming, for whatever reason, we don't see them all the way down here in Florida anymore. There are other places in between where they must be overwintering. No, if you go up to Tallahassee and go to St. Mark's, there was a good number up there. A little farther north. Mm -hmm. You still have a question, Alex? Um, not so much a question, but more just a personal accomplishment, like a little tidbit of information I thought you guys would find interesting. Sure. Okay, so um, when I lived in Illinois a couple of years ago, I lived next to a pretty big forest preserve, which was like my home patch, I guess, for birding. And one of the days I was out there, we found uh, two green wing teal, but I mean, it wasn't super out of the ordinary, except for the fact that they had little 10 10 little chicks in tow and we and the uh, game warden and the bird warden at that time we just dug around for weeks and came to the conclusion that my sighting was the first record of breeding green wing teal throughout the entire state wow. and wow. after after the fact the chicks were pretty closely monitored I don't know if they ever were ringed or banded or any of that, but I just know that 
uh, there were some people out there doing work on with them. So I'm glad I was able to do that. And I, I had no idea that it was even like, <laughs> like a first until, because cool. I posted the photos and then my mentor at the time was like, that is not, that's not right. <laughs> yeah. No. I guess to be really secretive on the breathing when they're breathing because they're vulnerable. So mm -hmm. it's good that you can find it. Yeah. That's what's cool about having a patch. Sometimes you get surprises. Yeah. You really get to know your local area. I miss living there. It was just a, a walking distance away that I would go. About a 3,000 acre preserve is where I lived on the border of. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's nice. how I got into birding. Oh, look 